Good morning. Welcome to today's community briefing. My name is Gregory Sneed, and we are glad you're here to join us. Today is the 14th of September in the year 2023. And my name is Gregory Sneed, and the company is Lifesaver Financial Services. I help my clients feel better about their money. Our guest today is uh, Lori Gay. I almost said Gray. Lori Gay, <laughs> and uh, she is with uh, Neighborhood Housing Services, and she'll be sharing some valuable information about us, about the housing industry. Uh, but we are glad you are here. And uh, now, without further delay, I'm going to introduce the queen. You still Egyptian? Yeah, Egyptian queen. Yeah, there's still a residual there. Uh, the Egyptian <laughs> queen <laughs> of the community briefing, Miss Crystal Mitchell. Welcome, 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 guys. Glad to have you here um, for joining us again on another phenomenal Thursday morning at the Community Briefing with our incredible team here and our awesome guest that's coming in to talk about a really important topic in Los Angeles and I guess in the whole state of California is housing because that's so important. We got a major issue, so... Looking forward to hearing from her. I am the co-director of Recycling Black Dollars, as well as I have my own practice of accounting bookkeeping uh, for the small and consulting and, and coaching for the small business community. Uh, this platform was inspired to make sure that we got firsthand information when it was on the table by the people that are sitting at the tables uh, where the discussions are being made it appears on a regular basis about us black folks. <laughs> and so... We need to make sure we get the first-hand information so we can operate immediately and not when it's an afterthought. So this is an inspiration that uh, came uh, about during the pandemic. I just felt it was so important. And so that, and now it's created a life. We have this amazing team that every week we come with some incredible people really keeping us informed. So we thank you all that are our regulars that come out every week and continue. And let's make this be the platform where the information for anything that's going on in LA, um, in the country, in the world about us, this is where you get that information. So thank you so much. We want to thank our sponsors. It's powered by Recycling Black Dollars and the Black Businesses, uh, the BBA, the Black Business Association. And we're monetarily sponsored by Edison Southern California Gas Company, PCR, Wells Fargo Bank, and Los Angeles LDC. And we want to thank them so much uh, for participating. Anyone else wants to sponsor? We are always open. <laughs> so um, our team, Mr. Gregory Sneed, myself, Mrs. Robin Billups, and Mr. Stephen Turner. Stephen is our producer, and he brings, he makes all the connections to make all these incredible people appear on this screen. So uh, thank you for supporting us. And now with that, I'm going to throw it over to Ms. Robin. Good morning, everybody. Good day, I should say. Glad to be here. Robin Billups with the Billups Group. I assess a coach and push my clients towards strategic plans. If you're dealing with issues regarding procurement, diversity in procurement, and or compliance issues, those are the things that I focus on. I am a deal junkie. I love commercial real estate, so I'm excited about NHS being on today. And my word for the week, as every week, vote vote, vote, and bring 10 other people to vote. We're coming down to the wire. They're not expecting us to be at the polls. We need to show them better than we can tell them. And so again, vote, vote, vote. I'm throwing it back to Greg. All right. Now, I, I didn't realize my microphone was off before. <laughs> not off, but it was, uh, the setting wasn't there. So now we're there. So um, our guest today, I, I and forgive me, I do have a friend named Lori Gray. So if I if I mess up, y'all know that I mean to say Lori Gay. She is president and CEO of the Neighborhood Housing Services of Los Angeles. And <clears throat> she is uh, in that uh, capacity for, for a while. She'll be telling us more about it. Um, it's also a, uh, a, a neighborhood uh, lending services and the uh, um, Na Neighborhood Housing Services Neighborhood Redevelopment Corporation. All right, so the three companies are Activate Nonprofit Lending, Development, and Neighborhood Revitalization throughout Los Angeles 
County. So she's worked in community development for over 35 years, focusing her efforts on rebuilding impoverished communities and creating mechanisms for community empowerment. She also serves as a board chair for the National Black Community Developers Group, board member of the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, member of Neighborhood Works, and the National Community Initiatives Advisory Committee. And there's a bunch of other stuff in there. I'm, I'm sure that she will cover <laughs> through that as well. Um, but she has uh, worked for Neighborhood Housing Services, not, just, just, recent, just a recent hire, right? No, since 1990. Uh, she holds an MBA degree from Pepperdine University, a Bachelor's of Science degree in Development, Resource, and Consumer Economics from the University of California at Davis. She's a licensed minister, praises, mm -hmm. and she's married to Bob Gay and mother of faith and grace. Mm -hmm. Without further delay, please welcome to the virtual stage, Lori Gay. Thank you so much. I'm laughing at Coach Greg. As I always tell him, please just read one line on my bio. It makes me sound old. <laughs> and so I uh, want to make sure that um, if you hear any weird sounds, I'm at a hotel conference training seminar today. So we're trying to do our best here. Uh, I'm actually at the Federal Home Loan Bank event. Um, in South Orange County somewhere and uh, with a lot of bankers and credit unions and that whole uh, system through the Federal Home Loan Bank, you know, can be at risk. And they're coming out in the next two weeks with a report that's called FHLB 100. And it's trying to look at is the Federal Home Loan Bank relevant, right? And does it have um, the juice it needs to continue to help fund the nation's communities through credit unions and your smaller scale banks, some big banks, depending on the region. So I'm on the board of directors there and it's, I tell them all the time, it's one of the hardest things I do. It really is because I'm always focused on my time and making sure I'm efficient and that I'm really uh, reinvesting in the community myself, right? With my time and my resources, my whatever talents I might have. And we just, the business of the bank, you know, three, $400 billion uh, amongst its membership getting on the street is a big deal in three states. And so, uh, but it's so hard to stay focused on that community mission because the business of it takes up a lot of time. And so I think what I'd say is I uh, did a PowerPoint. Um, I wanted to zip through some of those slides if we have them, if we don't, I'll just talk for 10 seconds about us and then certainly be open to some questions. But uh, I think that you, this is a critical time we're in. Uh, don't take it lightly, please, as Robin said. Thank you, Robin. Uh, getting out the vote, making sure that we speak up when least expected is always a great thing. And there's lots of legislation moving now throughout the state and federal level and at our county levels. Don't miss LA County, y'all those who are from that space. We have a lot of things, a lot of money that's going through the county and that 10% set aside for diverse and inclusive programming that we all voted in matters. And we have to make sure, right, that um, folks are using it and that the programs we know are getting funded. So I'm kind of being a watchdog for that right now. I wanna encourage some of you to do that because there's all these groups that formed during COVID, if I can say this out loud, that say they serve our community and they don't. And if they are, they just got started. And some of you on this phone, I see Joe Ruzan, Constance, Robin and others, we've been working 20 and 30 years. I'm more than 30 years at NHS, I'm exhausted. Uh, but it's, you know, you've been working and the ideas you have need to be funded and they need to be funded well. And I still call myself a scrapper, right? I'm, I'm yeah, making bricks with no straw. And that's kind of a shame. And so we wanna do better, be better, help each other. And what I keep finding, um, I see Karen Clark is joining, hi Karen. Uh, what I keep finding is that we're not collaborating you guys in ways that we could to be stronger together. We're still in some silos. So I just wanna challenge us to that. 
you're all people who are running your businesses, uh, you know your craft, and we need to trust that amongst each other and say, you know what, let's get on here and do get our work done together. And I think the power in that now is more than it's ever been. And so part of why we start something like the Black Community Developers Group is to challenge Black CEOs all over the country to be available to each other in, in multitudes of ways. If we need to share staff on something or vendors, this is the time to do it. And COVID showed us a lot of stuff we didn't know, and now we know it. And how do we dump all that in to make our community stronger? And as we know, our community always extends to what we call BIPOC, which you know includes other people of color groups and those who are not of color who are doing great work in the neighborhood. So we're not stingy, we're not greedy, we're not awful, but we also have to make sure we take care of ourselves. And so I would just encourage you, that's my biggest thing I'm on a, a good broom about. I'm not the Wicked Witch of the West or nothing. <laughs> I'm on a campaign, right? To be able to say, let's be stronger together. There's Black LA, there's Black Seattle, there's Black Detroit, right? And then there's Brown LA. Brown, how do we combine a bunch of that and make sure that our communities thrive? So that's my big message today, Greg, and Robin, Steve, uh, is that I wanted to get that out. I'm so grateful to Constance who joined our team earlier this year and she's pushing me in some spaces. I'm pushing her in some spaces and we've always known each other and tried to support now doing it together. You know, we got to figure it all out. And so you can bug her. <laughs> She equals us and uh, make sure to never lose sight that NHS does lots of small business related work. We always have, we're just way in the background. So Constance joining the team helps us think about it more every day, right? And we're that group that, you know, you don't um, realize that if somebody's coming to us and they have a cleaners they own, they're leveraging their mortgage, their home, to be able to run that cleaners in many cases. And if they get in trouble with their mortgage or they have tenant buildings that didn't pay rent during COVID, right? Now they're in trouble. And that problem becomes everybody's problem because now the neighborhood cleaners is at risk and could be gone. And not only do you lose a business, but you lose the family and the generations that are tied to that mortgage. And so I think there's all these ripples, you guys, that are all of us together. And I wanna just make sure that we're always being honest and transparent about the needs in the neighborhood. I don't know, uh, Greg and Steven, if you can show the PowerPoint at all that I sent over earlier. I got it ready, you wanna wait? All I'm, right, I'm right now, brother, let's, light. You ready? Let let's me know. zip through, because I'll just okay. keep rambling, you know, so I wanna focus things and then people can always get a copy of it from me later. All right, hopefully you guys should see it uh, any minute now, any second? Yes, it's right there, thank you, Greg. All right. So let's that commute, building legacy. That's what I wanted to focus on today. Let's go to the next slide. That's who NHS is. We're a nonprofit lender and community developer focused on building stronger neighborhoods and strengthening families. Most people know us as the region's largest affordable homeownership provider. Next slide. Okay. Oh, and then that's a minute, uh, uh, Crystal and uh, Robin. While I have the slide up, I can't monitor chat. So if you guys will uh, will take over on that, please. Thanks. Go ahead, sorry. And I put the mission statement in there, we always do. Next slide, Greg. And so this is our core business lines uh, that people know us for. And we see that little circle that everything's attached to as our system uh, uh, of both community engagement, lending, construction project management. And then the core to our whole business is financial counseling and education. Get them in, keep them in. Next. And then I, I just wanted to put in here some of what we've been focused on over the last you know, 39 years. Uh, and we mentioned being the region's largest affordable homeownership provider because we touch all these spaces, right? And so we, we passed 27,000 housing units um, late last year that we've been involved with, whether we're lending to people, we educate, educated them and they closed on a loan. So it's always about that piece. But it's also the home improvement world. And we do hundreds of units of production every year uh, of lending money to families who need to get their homes improved or they come to us for project management. So that's a big deal. And then that counseling is the ridiculous number that most people never believe, but that we're really talking to people all the time. 
hundreds of people per week. And so it adds up over 39 years. Uh, when we do group and large scale events, there's sometimes been thousands of people depending upon crisis. So it's a lot of folks that have come through to get some help and get that group or one-to-one -one counseling from us, always expanding with young people and always creating block clubs. Next slide. And then I wanted to just give you a little sense. This is the latest one they gave me uh, in the March calendar. I didn't update it, but it just gives you a sense of our penetration around housing in terms of people we're touching that need us with whatever services we have. And the blue is people who are thinking about buying and the red is existing homeowners. And then we need to start to add our business owners impact in here just so people see it. And then we track it according to their incomes, right? And so you start to see that during COVID, we got uh, a lot more people who were what we call moderate income. So they were not in the low income strata, but that they were um, also going toward the middle class. Because my middle class folks were calling to see if they could buy a home and whether there were gonna be foreclosures. And then they were going to class to get prepared. Next slide. I always want to mention our center, and I'll forget if I don't put the picture in. All those things on the left tell the ridiculous, crazy work that's going on at the center. It's an infinite space to get change happening. We're uh, based in Compton, and it was kind of our legacy work as NHS to be able to say to people, here's an opportunity, here's what we're doing, here's who we are, and we are doing it with friends. And so our newest friend will be the USDA joining us, uh, if I can finish all the paperwork they need, uh, later this year, early into next year, with their Southern California uh, office. And so that then is game changer for us around urban ag, uh, healthy foods, farming and business, uh, ag tech jobs, right? It's kind of almost infinite. If you think food and everything related to it, and uh, soil, you'll have a sense of how powerful that relationship is and will become for all of us. And being able to just walk in and sit down with the uh, National Conservation Service and USDA, because they come as a package, I think is gonna be a phenomenal opportunity for our young people. I'll just mention here too on that space that we um, did not know that USDA provides full scholarships to HBCUs for over 200 uh, college degrees that kids might be interested in serving or being a participant in in the future. So if you've got a child or grandchild, great grandchild, whatever, that needs to go to school and they'll consider an HBCU, USDA can pay for it. Uh, yes, they'll be looking for something that might touch food, but there's so many points of entry, you guys, it's over 200 majors, so I wanna mention that. I also want to invite all of you to our monthly farmers markets, our resource fairs. If you've got a business you want to highlight, right? Those monthly events tend to have about 500 to 1,000 folks coming through. If we run our programming right, we're doing housing and small business workshops inside while people are outside. And I think that that leaves lots of room for families. Some of our other tenants there, uh, go back one more time. Sorry, Greg. Uh, include uh, everything from anti-human trafficking to family intervention services. So just a lot going on. Next slide. I just wanted to show some of our advertising. Next slide that you may be more familiar with. And then some of our rehab work, right? Before and after uh, thousands of units of production in this space. And so we're trying to make impact block to block by fixing up the existing inventory and then adding to supply whenever we can. Next slide. Some of our advertising, this is one of our most popular flyers door to door and at our events. And I think it's not all that attractive and <laughs> doesn't do it for me, uh, but people love it because it shows potential payments. Uh, it shows some of the work they might wanna get done, right? And now ADU uh, accessory dwelling unit loans are our second highest uh, product request. And I'll mention that later, but just some things to think about. Next slide. 
And then this is just how we report out. It's an example. Uh, we took on a county contract for mortgage relief uh, during COVID. And now we've started a second one. And we, we do these detailed data reports that you're welcome to see anytime. We tend to put them in the public limelight this way uh, so that they can you know, make some sense. But high collaboration on this particular contract with a number of our other um, HUD housing counseling agencies. And we saw, let's look at the next slide too. We saw over um, 3,200 people that we were able to provide counseling to, to get to 198 folks that actually got grants. So a lot, a lot of work to try to make this program happen, but we got it done. Next slide. So this is my last kind of information slide. Um, we're focused on the legacy project. And this is a uh, quick picture of a groundbreaking we did a week and a half ago um, at 87th and Broadway. And that is a near three acre site that we've owned for the last eight and a half years. Uh, we bought a church that had been there for 67 years and had to demolish it immediately because there was so much asbestos ridden in the church that the city was going to cite it was going to cite us. Now, I don't know <laughs> if the church ever got cited or what was going on, but it was bad. So we maintained it all this time, a uh, lot of costs, a lot of focus, and now we're going to build 122 affordable homes on the site, um, one apartment building, and then a bunch of townhomes for fa working families. So this is not a homeless services project. It's working families. And it's an example of um, what we also believe is needed in the community, but making sure that people of color are uh, encouraged, sought after and supported to be able to live here in the next year and a half when we open. And also that we're building it and that we're you know, taking the risk to make sure that we invest in the neighborhood the way we want to. Uh, Another piece of the legacy project, of course, is adding family estate planning as a major tool in partnership with some groups. This ABEP group is the Association of Black Estate Planners. Uh, we're targeting everything from small business to families to properties to try to be able to acquire if we need to and or most importantly, to help people preserve their legacies. So one of the things we're doing that we just launched and we're gonna try to expand it as I can find the money is that up to 90% of the cost for estate plans will be deferred to the families. NHS will pay 90%, the family needs to pay 10% to get their estate plan created and set up so that they can make sure to preserve their wealth and not just have somebody take it if there's death in the family. And then last but not least, preserving cultural neighborhoods, right? Amidst high risk, high cost neighborhoods and uh, spaces. Next slide. So this is how you reach us. Uh, I think I have two slides of this information, but call us, email us, do Facebook, Twitter, the next slide so they can see some of those handles. You can watch us and follow us uh, in these spaces. And so um, what I really wanna say to everyone uh, is that you know we don't overstate ourselves, you guys. We never have, we never will. Uh, we do what we can. We get thousands of inquiries, thousands of people who need us. But what we're really interested in now is saying to each of you that we, we need to leverage ourselves more than we ever have. And we're great at trying to collaborate. We fall over trying to collaborate. But we want to engage you as much as we possibly can. We're not perfect. We won't ever be perfect, but we try. And what we really want to do is, particularly as we're focused on this legacy piece now, We've been at it for seven years talking about it, right? But now it's how do we make sure we're getting to the people we need and do the work we've got to do to preserve cultural legacy in our communities as well as family uh, and business legacy. And so I'm gonna keep raising money, that's my job. Constance, same thing, we're, we're getting out and trying to find every dollar we can to reinvest. But I think some of you have great ideas, you're running great spaces, and it's how do we include you, right, so that we can be stronger together. 
I will say to you that um, I took over a portion of our lending company back in late May. And one of the things I told the team is I want to work this pipeline because we had had over 400 families respond to an e-blast that we sent out on accessory dwelling units. And when something like that happens on one e-blast, we pay attention, as you can imagine. And what I said to them was, there's a, a pent up demand that we didn't quite know was there and we need to do something about it. And so over 385 people came to class the next week to find out about Don't Move, Improve and ADUs. And that what they were trying to do was beat a deadline that the state of California had, right? on that programming and they were giving out grants of up to $40,000. And then you get your ADU built, however you can get it done with a service provider or some contractor. Well, half the people thought that 40,000 would build an ADU. That would be no. <laughs> and then the other half wanted to activate either their own money through home equity lines of credit or see if NHS had something else free or cheap. So what we had was for families that were low income, $100,000 loan available that was deferred for 30 years, 3% fixed. Not a bad day. Putting that with the 40,000 could get them a small ADU in the backyard. I, of course, was not as interested in, okay, I'm going to make 100 loans right now, as I was why they were coming. Why would a senior at 84 years old want to have somebody they didn't know in their backyard? What's going on with you, right? Let's get to the why of the thing. And what we found was that there were two main reasons people were talking to us and you need to know them. One is that during COVID, people realized with the loss that they wanted to live intergenerationally and that they didn't mind it. And that is very unusual for families of uh, um, modest means to be doing, you know, particularly black folks to want to live together and not um, be apart, right? And I think a lot of that's been going on for a while, but we saw the mass of it. The second thing is that people need the money. You know, if they were furloughed, uh, they ran up their credit cards during uh, COVID, whatever their issues were, they need the money. And so we've been closing loans. We're under construction on, I don't know, 25 or 30 or something ADUs right now. And that's going to continue. And I won't have the resources, as you can imagine, to keep lending that cheaply but we're partnering with local credit unions and some bankers to be able to expand upon the work, right? The best we can, because those two reasons tell me we got to protect ourselves, right? And it makes no sense to do the ADU and they don't have an estate plan, no will, no living trust, nothing. And so I'm seeing people with free and clear properties come in and they need the help. They need to uh, deal with deferred maintenance on their own property. So we're trying to do it all. It's a big space of our business. A lot of small business owners coming in saying I'm in trouble at my home and now my business is struggling post COVID and what do I do? You know, so all kinds of counseling. So what I'd say is um, we can work together. We're happy to be available to you. Uh, we're happy to figure out, we're working with local realty boards again, really saying let's, let's get in this struggle to make sure uh, that our young people have a path toward the future that matters and that is sustainable, right? So I'll stop there and uh, be happy to take any questions you may have. Lori, hey, it's Robin. And again, I, I'm delighted for, you, for NHS to be on today. Um, I am a huge proponent. I was actually involved in NHS since 1980. Um, help to build those five. And the only one that's still standing is the one that you're running. And having Constance added to the staff has just been an amazing, amazing partnership. So we salute you. We totally salute what you do. Um, when I was at the City of Hope, I talked to a lot of young people who don't own property, hadn't thought about property. And what I tell them is sign up for the class. So can you guys talk a little bit about the classes that you host because I think that that education is what gets people to where, they, the, where they're trying to go versus, as you said, they got 40,000 and they think they can build an ADU and or seniors who are in these properties um, not understanding that maintenance, deferred maintenance will get you in trouble with the city or the county. So talk about the classes 
that you guys host because I think that that's the, the to me, the literacy of it all is, is, is the most critical piece. Absolutely. Um, we've run the same classes for kind of a long time. We added, uh, and so that's financial education around buying a home and keeping a home. So a series of workshops around that. And then our fast track class is generally the most popular over time. It's an eight hour class and we've broken it up virtually to two four hour classes, which is still a long time being online, but people come, they love it. Uh, and that's the soup to nuts on buying a home and keeping a home. And then our don't move improve class is just that. It's, it's tips, details in 45 minutes on how to keep your house. Uh, then we have foreclosure prevention, mortgage relief. We have a financial literacy and hold on a second. I told you I was at a conference. <laughs> She's coming through with her uh, cart. So we have a financial literacy and credit recovery type class that people take. And then what that does is that gets them assigned to a counselor if they want to continue. And they literally can be one-to-one -one with the counselor and case management type stuff as long as they want. And I think that that has been a real miracle for people. I've seen people in my pipeline for eight and 10 years. And, and, you know, it just doesn't matter. We're here for that. That's the mission. And so Constance and I have a job of finding that, that money that keeps us alive while we are then helping people, right, get through and get to the goal they have. That's perfect. Last but not least, Robin, let me mention this. We did a Legacy <laughs> Summit on Juneteenth weekend. You're going to see more of that from us where we're doing work workshops around legacy uh, our monthly legacy workshops are kind of that pre and post all those classes I mentioned, mm -hmm. but then the summit brings in all these folks from some everywhere to teach specifically around estate planning for your business and your home, and then to sit with lawyers, right, that's the vision of it, uh, to get started on packaging your estate plan, and I think that that piece is the last of it from NHS that we can offer uh, to the public, right? To families, to small business owners and others, uh, because we need to. And we're seeing too much loss that's kind of crazy stuff. So we were at a probate sale, Constance and I, and uh, some of our staff this past Sunday, I'll be at another one this coming Sunday. And this one was in San Pedro. Mm. So I overpaid more than I'd normally spend. But there is a middle class family that will move into that property with equity, right? Mm -hmm. Think about that. In San Pedro, three minutes from the port, um, just phenomenal location. And we'll do the same again in Compton, see if we can win the bid this weekend. And then there's a couple we've seen that might be in Crenshaw. So those are our hot spots. Those are spaces we care deeply about. And if I have to buy it to keep it affordable, I will. Lori, you know, I just, just we, we, we know all about the organization, but how, where, did, where did the fire in your belly come from in doing this work? I've known you a very, very long time, but I don't think I ever asked you, where did you grow up and what was the influence that got you where you are right now? The, over and above the fact that I know you're a very faithful person. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, that's interesting, we never talked about that. I grew up in a, I grew up in a little what I call redneck town in Northern California and uh, Orville. So near at the Orville Dam, 30 minutes south of Chico State. Um, and I was the only black in my schools with my siblings until probably about fourth grade, right? But getting spit on, called out of your name every day, it impacts you, right? But my fa father was the only uh, black pastor in town that lived there. There were four or five other black churches in town, but they drove in from Sacramento <laughs> and so and left right back out. And so we kind of took the hit for being preacher's kids, but what we never lost was this notion of caring for others. Give more than you take. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's been my lifelong passion. I've been blessed more than I can ever tell you about by sharing, right, and nurturing with people. And now I'm crying all the time when I see uh, families come in and they own their homes free and clear 
and they just need the deferred maintenance taken care of so they don't miss the opportunity to stay and age in place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I lost both my mother and mother-in-law during COVID mm -hmm. from old age. They, they, you know, mm -hmm. they both died 88 and 98. Yeah. And my mother wanted to be in assisted living with friends. My mother-in-law was like, I don't need all that. I can die in my bed. And she did. <laughs> <laughs> and so that choice, the respect, right? The dignity. Uh, if I could build every convalescent slash um, aging in place type space possible in this region, I would do it, right? If I had the resources. Uh, because our seniors are very vulnerable, you guys. They're vulnerable. And I'm 61, so I'm, I'm going to be considered senior in five whole seconds, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's how do we care for ourselves when our young people, yuppies, buppies, chuppies, whoever, do not want to <laughs> live in the space. It, they don't want to live in the space that uh, Madeir and patriarchs and others have prepared and held on to for 50 years. So we're changing that narrative. You know, 51% of our business now uh, on that purchase side are young black people, the buppy, the millennial, and we're going after them, you know, and the Hispanics right behind it. So that's exciting. Somebody said, what's a chuppy? It, it, we couldn't come up with something for the uh, Latinos. So it's Chicano urban professional. <laughs> it's as close as we can. <laughs> I love it. Hey, Alan, you had a question? You yes, go yes. Thank sure. you. And first of all, Fantastic presentation, Lori. Thank you for everything that NHS does. Quick question, uh, maybe a couple of actually, but since NHS is a community development financial institution, with that designation, how does that assist you in developing different loan programs that will assist in home ownership as well as in home improvement? And now with this new, uh, the age of building, building ADUs. So how do you use the CDFI designation uh, to increase home ownership and, and home ownership wealth within our community. Yeah. I think the big deal there, Alan, thanks for the question, is it helps us attract resources that are modest so we can relend affordably. And so as a CDFI, that designation wasn't super special. We've had it for 28, 29 years now, but or longer, I don't even remember, 1997, whatever that is. And so with that designation, we can attract grants and low cost capital, right? That we put back on the street. And so for example, I'll send out a, what I consider a very small ask to some of our bankers over the weekend for $10 million for ADU support and investment. And I'll ask them to borrow at five and I'll relend between five and a half and six and a half. Mm -hmm. And that's for the middle class. My lower income families, Generally, they don't have that money right now, not today, uh, for borrowing one hundred and forty to two hundred thousand dollars. Right, it's too big a payment for them for an ADU, just as an example. Right. But on the other hand, being able to borrow cheap or attract grant resources, I got three loan requests this morning. My staff emailed me since I'm off site, and all three, well, two of the three of them had a scenarios where someone had a second or third mortgage that was for something they were paying on. And I always ask the why, but you know, today I didn't know the answer. Um, and they needed 30 or 40,000 to pay off that third. Mm -hmm. And then NHS would substitute that more affordably or take out the second, right? Mm -hmm. And leave the first in place if it wasn't predatory. And so I think that that kind of scenario, subordinate financing as we call it, is one of the ways we're very helpful. We hope to always tie it to um, home improvement, you know, or refinancing for more affordability. But again, scarce resources, we spend as much as we can. And, you know, I need a billion dollars every day. That's what I need. <laughs> kind of a, a follow up to that. Uh, <laughs> do you guys also work through CalHAFA on some of the purchase transactions? Uh, for you know some of their down payment assistance, both both on the actual down payment as well as their closing costs, and in addition to Cal Hapa, what about LA County's program and LA City's program? I I, I know you know Cal Hapa is pretty straightforward and easy to work with. The the, the city could be a little tenuous, but uh, mm -hmm. is NHS also involved with those in agencies in doing mortgage lending? 
We are. And I was on with uh, Tina Johnson Hall, who runs Cal HFA last week. And we just kept going. I thought she was giving me 30 minutes and I got more time. I was so grateful. Thinking through programming, right? Yeah. So we'll work with any of their programs, city, county, federal, state, whatever. You know, one of our largest active programs is the Cal Home Program through the state, which right. we've managed and won awards on for over 23 years since its inception. And there's just never enough resource, right? We have very high demand. Uh, and what the more you get done, the more people want to help you get done. Right. But it's it's still never enough. We all know that. And so I think if we can continue to figure out ways to pool our resources, that's going to help our communities that are in dire need right now. One final question, because I don't want to hog the show. But, <laughs> you know, you, you and NHS has you know, hit home runs, you guys swing for the fences. And with so many of the bank mergers that have taken place, you have banks that are now closing branches and consolidation. And I, I'm just wondering, I'm kind of thinking out loud here, is there any thought or are there any thoughts uh, with you and your team in terms of maybe transitioning over to an MDI, maybe working with the Chase or uh, a Wells or one of these institutions that are closing their branches in our community? and acquiring them and actually move it into a banking institution. And I say that partly, and I, I don't want to be offensive to anyone, but a lot of our minority banks in LA, the minority instit owned institutions aren't really doing a lot of residential lending, tend to be focusing on credit cards and apartments and things like that. And that's great, but I'm not sure how that necessarily helps the housing situation out here in, in our county. So any thoughts on, on a, another big boat bodacious swing of the bat and become a, become a financial institution. Well, I, I need a billion dollars. That's my mantra. <laughs> well, Greg, Greg's going to write that check. So yeah, just write the check there. I would just say to you that um, they're in an, in an environment of scarce resources. There's always still infinite vision, right? And I've always believed as Constance said, where there's vision, there's provision. <laughs> um, and I think that we just need to keep after it and putting our story out there, all of us, right? And saying that the need is great and that we want to oh, yeah, get good, yeah. great, good and great work done. But the other thing I'd say that's really um, of importance is if we become a member of some of these banking institutions, yeah. like I'm here as a board member with the Federal Home Loan Bank, but the reality is if I join that banking system, they have rules and constraints that limit the kind of flexibility we've had on the street forever. So part of what I did was join the board to help change that, right? And make it more flexible for all CDFIs uh, in California, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, and we hope nationally to be able to join that system and have access to the capital, but still mm -hmm. stay as flexible as we'd love to stay. And so I think there, that work's going on, right? And we need to be able to access all these programs. The Dream for All program was gone in like nine days, $300 million in our state. And we were not the lead groups. It was not a cultural overwhelm at all. And the program was uh, written for that, but in the end uh, didn't reach all the families that it was purported to try to be prepared for. So that's where we all have to be talking. We have to be ready, right? And we have to be prepared to advance when it's time to strike. I guess, lastly, how can independent mortgage companies like myself participate and, you know, assist on the lending side? He is, he is still in the show, you got, you got. Um, I'd say the independent mortgage company, let's make a deal, right? Gotcha. And so there's a balance for us. We operate on the lending side through all lending channels that are available and open that we can. Uh, wholesale has been uh, the main distribution channel we've utilized over the years because we get a small fee for packaging a deal like any broker. But the retail channel still does high volume business and it's how do we survive, right? How do we make sure we get just a little bit to turn a great client over and make sure that that client can get funded? That's what we care about. We don't want to send people out and then they get rejected. They're used to rejection. So it's how do we make sure we tighten down our products and services together? And so some of the credit unions that are here at this conference, you know, we're sitting together because they 
need loans. They need members, yeah. right? And we want to make sure that we don't overlook them as we expand. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Not at all. Lori, Lori with all of the, um, to your point, between COVID and folks being laid off and pushed out and pushed up and pushed over, um, talk to us a little bit about your delinquency and talk to us. Uh, the other thing that I'm interested in is these these financial services companies that are not meeting their compliance numbers as far as mortgages and credit cards and services for folks in the BIPOC, BIPOC community, really Black community. BIPOC. Well. <laughs> BIPOC. BIPOC, that's right. So if you could talk a little bit about those two, I'd appreciate it. So delinquency and BIPOC. Yes. Um, and CRA, really. Yes. So what we know is uh, our delinquency has been less than 1% for 39 years. Make good loans, keep good loans, you know, educate. Education is the key in our world beyond making good loans, and doing good underwriting. I'd rather say to someone not now and preserve my portfolio and tell them, come back here when you make these following adjustments and just tell them no and send them on their way. Um, that said, Community Reinvestment Act was formulated in 1977, 78. It, it's helped a lot. Absent that legislation, there would not be some of the investment in our communities that we have. I think though, now looking back on it all these years, it's still a joke. And the facts are the too big to fail banks at all pick. They're not really invested or interested in our communities other than lipstick on a pig type scenarios. And I'm very candid and crass about that. I think absent uh, being forced to do some things or getting in trouble because they didn't lend or had unfair lending practices, people don't want to. And I'm phenomenally unpopular for that. I don't care because I think it's the truth. And when you get in trouble and you've already figured out the actuarial, to get out of trouble by just putting lipstick on, right? The community doesn't really change. I, for one, am ashamed that I can drive down most of our streets and not see every house and every yard and every business looking phenomenal, right? And so that billion dollars is my joke about how much money could easily be spent, you know, in the next month to help people. And there's a stigma still around race, credit, and income, and we need to change that. And I, they thought that the Community Reinvestment Act play would do it, but I don't believe it. I sit in too many boardrooms mm -hmm. and I sit in too many conversations, Robin, just like you and others, Karen and others, you know, it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, am not interested in continuing to talk about how black people have not advanced. The truth is when you have 400 years of systemic racism in front of you, there's a reason you're struggling. There's also a poor positioning of particularly black and brown people that we need all this extra education to somehow achieve. Well, no, <laughs> financial literacy is 95% of the American public's problem. You know, if you talk to people about their budget, they're, hey, not, they're not living by a budget. They are, I told you I was at a conference. <laughs> they're okay. not living by a budget. They are living by the seat of their pants. Mm -hmm. And so that's true for most Americans, not just black people or brown people. So I think it's difficult. And what we need to do is be unabashed about saying it and join together wherever we can to say, we're not somehow operating on crutches. We just need to strategically overcome the barriers that were put up in front of us for generations now. And then I think that uh, we can always make some adjustments within culture, pick a culture, Mm -hmm. to not be greedy and not be focused on singular achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I try to balance it out that way, but I think there's a lot to be done. Excellent, excellent. I, um, as I mentioned, you know, when you talked about San Pedro, I remember the NHS office in San Pedro, right? Oh. You know, oh. there, there were just offices all over the city. And, yep. um, and, and people, here we are today, they're almost 40 years later, people are still just finding out about NHS, which makes me crazy. You know, you guys have <laughs> you've done articles, you've done the interviews, you've done you, success stories, constant success stories. So I just want to thank you for the work that you do. I want to thank you for the candidness. You know, I don't think you know any other way 
which is what I appreciate. It's straight no chaser, straight no chaser. Crystal, did you have a question? <laughs> <on that? laughs> uh, no, I just, uh, you know, it's just amazing that there's so many of us that are really working hard in this community to make it mm -hmm. a better place for us as black people. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't know. And so you're right, Robin, this is the platform. This is the reason for the community briefing hey. is because we no, need I... to hear from Lori Gay. We need to, <laughs> Constance comes on quite frequently because mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the only way we make our community better. And Lori, I have to tell you, I am always preaching about our silos. Yep. There is no reason us as black people uh, cannot work together. We're just listening to the outside world telling us that we don't work together and that's not true. Right. And so I thank you so much for making that your first statement. <laughs> <laughs> Because I believe if we all came together and became one voice, we would make such an incredible difference for our for the next community, the generation coming. And due to what's happening in the next in 2024 in the election, it is so imperative that we do that. So thank you for being a guest today. Thank you. Thank you all. So I'm so grateful and humbled. And well, you know, on a personal note, on a personal note, I will say when my when when I tell students, as soon as you graduate from college, the first thing you need to do is sign up for the NHS program. Just sign up and get that education, <laughs> because if you get the education, now you have the binder. Now you have the resources. So my son graduated from Florida and m found a house and he goes and mom, the broker says I need 20 percent down. I'm like, I told you all I got is loves. And that student loan. That's all you're getting out of me and dad, right? <laughs> so I sent him to NHS. He had gone to the class. He pulled his binder out, made that call, closed his deal. And he's been, again, the advocate for NHS as well. So it, it works. The, the, the system works. The beautiful thing is that the flexibility that you have to look at a client's package without saying, I need to check the box. Right. Yeah. You know, and that 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 flexibility, Karen, a, I'm coming to you just a second. But that flex, the flexibility that you have. My mom always said I have a degree in journalism. When are you going to use your journalism degree? I said I use it every day as a lender. My job is to tell the story. Right. That's right. Tell the story That's right. Of the package of the client of the site to credit to get them to sign off because I didn't have signing authority. Karen, a. I just want to chime in, Lori and say thank you also. I've been a fan for probably, I don't know, 30, 30 years ago, way, way back to when I was at B of A and I heard you speak at a forum. I didn't even know who you were. I just kind of stumbled in there. And, um, but what you said, there was a discussion about Ebonics. Mm -hmm. And you said, Ebonics is not the issue. The issue is the fact that we don't have a self-sustaining community. Mm -hmm. where our children can be taken care of without having to leave. Mm -hmm. And if we had that, it wouldn't matter that they were speaking Ebony, any other language, because we would understand them just like a self-contained Hispanic community or Asian community. Right. Like I just said, you know what? She has cut right through the chase, right mm -hmm. through. And I've been a fan ever since, but I just want to say to everybody, for me, Lori is an example of, you know, we all operate within these circles, right? We got circle of control. We got a circle of influence. We got a circle of concern. And so many of us, when we, when we uh, move outside of that circle of control, we skip right over that circle of influence and go to circle of concern. And we just hang out there. We just hang out there complaining and talking about shit. We can't do nothing about. But Lori is an example of when she doesn't control something, she moves into that circle of influence and she operates there until she gets something handled. And that's something we can all do. And if we don't think we have a lot of influence, well, first of all, you have more than you think. But second of all, all you gotta do is practice, just practice it, practice that discipline because we can all make a difference. Maybe not have the same impact as NHS Lori, but we can have an impact, each and every one of us. So I just want to thank you. You've been my, you know, my example for 30, 40 years. And I'm always a fan. And when I saw you were speaking, I didn't even see you were speaking until 10 minutes before the damn thing. <laughs> and I sent out an email to some of my colleagues and I say, Lori's the next level. And it's always good to get some nuggets of wisdom. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful. 
and I just say I don't want to overlook Constance. I've been mentioning her That's name. Her. I was gonna, have, yeah, I was going to say to have her join the team. And we're radical. You know, we're crazy over here at NHS. And I said, Constance, just make a decision. You're not quitting on me. Just stay in here. Don't just yank my hair. You know, and so we do that at, because we love and we care. So Constance, I appreciate. I want to open. I, I want to open the mic for Constance to have a few words. We're we're coming down to the time, but I did want to have Constance to come on because again, I was elated when she, Karen, and I were just celebrating. That is a perfect combination. Why is it a perfect combination? Because you know how strong these two sisters are, and <laughs> how to get some things done. We're going to get more done this then. But Lori is definitely a visionary. Sometimes mm -hmm. she says things about things that we can do. And I just want to go, okay, I know you have this vision that I don't necessarily <laughs> have, but okay, let's just do it. And it's really, I'm just grateful to be in a position to where I'm working with an organization to where I can actually look at the impact that we have on yes. a regular basis. And it allows me, I sent her a thank you note and said, thank you for allowing me to grow in this organization with you. So I'm a happy camper. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Constance made a very valid point, especially for the lenders and the bankers and the financial services people on these calls. You know, we've been at these tables. We have stripes on our back um, because of you know, look, look, being able to look at the facts and look at the numbers and really even not even have to look at the numbers to know what the reality of it all that CRA says they're supposed to do this, but their actions, you know, don't don't line up with that. So, again, thank you. Um, Lori, is there any other words of wisdom that we should share with the community in regards to um, what I call next generation activity? I just say don't count them out. Right. And that you have to, whether it's in race or in income or in age, whatever it is, you have to go get people so that they understand that they are welcome. Right. And if they don't know that they are welcome, people pause. So we want to eliminate the pause. We want to put the go sign up to all things green in our community right now to be able to reach individuals and families who need us. You know, Jonathan went, Jonathan Wilson just left because he had to go to another appointment, but he made a very valid point. You know, let's get out of the complaining mode and let's get into the action mode. Always yeah. stay in that action mode. Constance? Yeah. I was just going to say, Theodora's hand is up in case you didn't notice it. But I wanted to say, join us every first Saturday at our Compton office, the Center for Sustainable Communities. We'd love for you guys to all come out and just see what we do on that Saturday. And we'll be at the Men's Empowerment Summit this weekend as well. So a lot going on. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. All righty, Theodore, quickly. And Constance, I saw her, I'm, I'm running this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a middle kid for real, Theodore. <laughs> Okay, so Lori, I'm echoing everything that everybody is saying right now. Uh, and thank you so much for being here, for helping our community. So I had two points. One was, number one, Lori, you said that, you know, by being the truth teller and the, uh, and the, pe the person who shows love to our communities, um, some of these uh, who want to keep lipstick on the pig type folks, um, well, let's just say that they, 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 they put roadblocks on, on your path. So how can we, we, this group, this platform and our respective networks support you so that, you know, we shore you up, you know? We may not have, we, not, we may not be able to help you get um, that billion dollar check from, you know, from Greg, uh, <laughs> but, um, what else can we do? How do we how do we keep you, um, you know, how do we help you keep yourself fueled? Number one and number two. The other thing was um, you, the the construction you guys are all doing and all that kind of good stuff. I wanted to offer that my company can help you all with a local hire effort in reference oh, great. to building we out building out. So we always need it. That'll that'll. Thank you. That'll be something Constance is getting us in the middle of next. 
on the local hire. But I think um, it's post and repost. You know, the social media space is huge. Uh, we always need every family to know. And then I'd say also, um, it's tell your own friends and family. Don't let somebody that's close to you lose anything, you guys, on their business or their home. If you know they're struggling, the shame is in not doing something. Yes. And instead of talking about Ray Ray and JoJo, just get them over here and let us get them in class and counseling and let them make their own decisions. I want to say options, options, options. Go ahead, Crystal. I want to say to both of you. So we're this platform is here for you. Recycling Black Dollars is here for you. Anytime you have uh, anything that you want to go out, I'll send it out to our network. Uh, so please, and at the end, with all of the commu the the blast that I do for this this program, I always have what's going on in our community. So let's you utilize each other's networks, and and make sure that. Uh, NHS is not an afterthought or somebody has to tell you after you've gone down a hard journey uh, to get to what you're looking to do. Let's make it the forethought and let's make it a priority that you know that is available. So thank you, Lori. Thank you, Constance. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Zadora, uh, for being here. Alan, uh, this has been a great presentation. The, the chats have just gone off the rails there. Uh, and everybody's looking again to close those silos, Lori. We really do want to close those silos. <laughs> And so we're at 1202. We want to thank you guys. You can find this um, show uh, streaming right now on Facebook, both Minds and Recycling Black Dollars. Uh, it will be up on YouTube very, very shortly. Uh, so please share and come back next week because Stephen is Stephen still here. Next week, we have Sharon Evans from the Business Research Group, Resource Group. On the 28th, we have uh, Jason Poo, uh, Regional Director, Regional Administrator with uh, HUD. On October 5th, uh, Bryce Flewellen, who was with Every Table, has now launched his own company, and mm -hmm. he will be coming back. On October 12th, uh, Greg Doolin, and he is uh, totally refurbishing uh, Doolin's on Crenshaw, and he's going to come back and share with us uh, that process and how he was going to get funding and construction. And then on the 19th of October, we have Sharon Padau, who is with the Martin Luther King Health mm -hmm. Foundation. Awesome, awesome. And come One last announcement, one last announcement. Our Dr. Vicki Mays just received an exceptional award that Stephen shared with us right before we uh, came online. So I don't have all the details, but you know, the beautiful thing about the people that we have on this show, I think one of our early shows the lady from um, um, UC Irvine is in the White House right now. You know, we got the Lori Gaze of the world who's global. You know, so again, we, we're, we're always looking for the right speakers with the right information so that once we hang up, we can actually implement. Awesome. Awesome. And tomorrow, for those of you, uh, check, tune in to the Business Zone with Crystal and Gilbert at 3 o'clock. We have Richard Palais, who is now uh, the Deputy District... Um, uh, what is he? The de um, for the S district director. Director for the SBA for the Small Business Administration. He took over for Victor Parker. So come on over to the it's streaming live. We are on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube tomorrow at three o'clock. So if you guys want to find out what's going on at the SBA with the new uh, director, we would love to have you guys check us out as well. Just you can find us online. Uh, streaming live on those platforms. So with that, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Robin, for doing a great uh, moderator. And, and as well as Alan, thank you, Lori. Thank you, Constance. All of you come back next Tuesday, next Thursday. Oh, my. Next Thursday for Sharon Evans. That's another mover and shaker in this city that is doing some amazing things. So Come on, guys. This is how we stay connected. This is how we make a better community for ourselves. This is how we gain a voice and become a dominant force in this country, not just in this state, but in this country. So we will see you guys. Have a great week. And uh, bye for now. Bye. We're going to have Karen A. come on to talk about the Barbara Morrison Theater that she's the owner of in the in the very, very near future. So get get ready. Yeah. Love it.